You've broken my heart. Everyone knows no, that you do it with no, the bar no, bar no, and you, no, you you're, so you don't Get really do this. No, you don't, you don't, you don't. And the reason being, and there is halakha around this, right? So so imagine I'm sitting down to write, yeah. okay? So what is going to happen with the... It's going to go up your nose. And what's going to happen? You'll sneeze. You'll sneeze, and what happens then? Then it gets on the, on the gets scroll. On the Torah. And okay. getting snot out of the Torah is next to impossible. Shalom, this is Nehemia Gordon. I am here in London with Mordechai, known also as Mark Michaels, who's written a series of books. He is a professional scribe, and you've written books about the history of uh, scribal activity and other things that we're going to get to. Shalom, Mordechai. Shalom, Nehemia. So... Uh, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to do this program um, was I, I took a course at uh, Oxford, and it was on, among other things, codicology, that is the history of Hebrew books and how they were put together. And I really walked away with an appreciation for what artisanship it is to write a book when you're doing it by hand, not with a modern pen, but with a uh, uh, what's called a calamus, which is basically a reed, or with a, uh, or, or with a quill. And, you know, I knew about this. I mean, I studied this for years. I've been working with manuscripts for years through photographs, but actually getting my hands in the manuscripts and learning some of the techniques, I was really blown away. And I wanted you to uh, communicate some of that to the audience. What is it like to be a scribe writing uh, books in the 21st century, writing books by hand? Okay, so, uh, so as a scribe, I'm a software stum. Uh, and stum stands for Sefer Torah. And uh, fill in a mezuzah, so the mm-hmm. main thing. So right, and to f- safer Torah is a Torah scroll. To fill in our phylacteries and mezuzah right, is the stuff. I don't know the how door to translate. Yeah, well, just, it actually just means yeah. door paste, literally. Right, right. But it's the scroll inside, and people right. get that confused. Okay. Um, and uh, in nowadays, uh, you either get commissioned to write a new one if you're mm-hmm. very lucky a to, Torah to do a Torah scroll for a, for a new community. Yeah. Uh, but actually, for a software, a lot of the work is around repairs and restoration. Okay. Uh, and particularly some of the really older ones, the historical ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I'm working at the moment on one from the Czech Scrolls. Uh, the so, guys, Trust. we're actually here at the Memorial Scrolls Trust. And I didn't know this when I invited you. This was just a space where we would <laughs> speak, and I found out you're one of the authorized scribes who works here. Authorized scribes. The work is massively interesting because you're writing yeah. down the Torah or the Megillah or whatever, and and, yeah. and you're reading it, and you're reading it without any rabbinic interpretation you're seeing the text there and then which is very important but you know you also want to try and beautify particularly if you are yeah i mean i'm a designer i'm a creative director so you want to beautify yeah. it even more and it says okay. uh this is my yeah. god and i'll beautify him mm. so scribes try to make ornate things do right so for example they, they, they have some scrolls here where at the top line of the scroll uh there is I, i'm going to use the texas word doohickeys there are little doohickeys on top there. Uh, they're like little um, flowery. They're not just yep. crowns. Not just crowns. They're like these these ornate crowns. Seen rainbows. And, and it's on top of the shin. And this is in a Torah scroll, not an Esther scroll. Yep. Yeah. So You've seen you, rainbows in a Torah scroll. Rainbows in a Torah scroll? In a Torah scroll. It's beautiful. Really? Rainbow. They're, they're I've rainbow never seen, top. Wow. Can you show us some of the things you do as a scribe? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, okay, so the first thing you do as a scribe, yeah. right, has got nothing to do with the kit. Okay. Right? And kit is the British word for equipment. Just for... Oh, absolutely. No, sorry, no, sorry. No, I'm very British. I'm just I, translating. I'm, I'm a British brother in law. Basically, as with all Jewish things, mm-hmm. it starts with a book. It starts with a book. Okay. The rule book. Yeah. Right? And the thing about being a software mm-hmm. is it's not just calligraphy. Yes, you have to have mm-hmm. calligraphic skills, right. but actually you need to understand halakha. Mm-hmm. So um, when I was uh, I was trained, uh, yeah. I was an apprentice yeah. to a uh, software, um, Vivian, who's with Ron Oliver, I'm missing dreadfully. And I learned masses from him. But it all starts from yeah. books, the rules. Yeah. So there are rules here. There are tons and tons of rules. I mean, this is actually only one of the many, many textbooks. Uh, that and it has pictures. Have. It has pictures because you need to have pictures occasionally. Ah, Keset HaSofer. Keset I've studied Keset this for some of my research. Okay. It's a very important book. Yeah. Um, it's not quite as important as uh, as some so, people will, will make it out to. So in this book, Keset HaSofer, he talks about what we mentioned before. He says, if you make a mistake and leave out a word, he says, don't write it above the line because our 
our readers aren't familiar with that, that and they'll be confused. confused. Because that's not by his time that things had changed. Right. Right. So what you've got to do is think about the time period at which mm -hmm. this was written and then try and... And this is 19th century. Yeah. So uh, I think it's a little bit earlier, but uh, so you can see here the mem. Yeah, so here are all the rules of how you okay. write a mem. Here are the things that you don't do with a mem. Here's the, the, so literally, here's a tikkun for, for Eicha, here's, and so on. If you want to write Eicha, here's the the different the letters. There's loads of uh, different rules because you need the rule book. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't... If you don't follow the rules, yeah. even if it looks like it's all right, it might not be. So it's the difference between it being kosher, kosher, yeah. valid, yeah. Uh, the real meaning of the word, and yeah. puzzle, which is invalid. Mm -hmm. uh, and it might look fine, but actually the scribe has broken a whole bunch of rules in order to do this. Yeah. You're not allowed to do that. So one of the rules that's of particular interest to me is around God's name. Yes. So in, in the Gemara and the Talmud, it says that a, a Torah scroll in which one single instance of the name is written without the proper intent, the whole mm -hmm. scroll is invalid. So to tell us what that means. Okay, so there's this concept called kavana, which you know, the word intention. Kavana is spiritual intention. Yeah. Uh, and there's no blessing for writing or fixing a Torah. There is no blessing for it. But what you have to do is make a statement. And that statement is largely around... I am doing this, uh, mm -hmm. behold, I'm doing this for the sake of the holiness of the Torah, the Tefillin, whatever you're doing. Yeah. And then when you get to God's name, and yeah. there are several versions of God's name, obviously. Right. So it's, you, in other words, it's God's personal name and titles are seven different. It's 10, I think, that you have to kind of okay. think about. Uh, and you stop and you go, I am writing this for the sake of God's holiness. Mm -hmm. Right. If you don't do that, then it is, it's, it, it's go back to that idea of it's, yeah. it's kosher or pasul. Looks like God's name's been written fine. Right. But actually, it hasn't been written with the right spiritual intention. It's one of the reasons you, don't, right. why you can't print a Torah. You can't. Because the machine has no intention. Yeah. And there was a robot Torah, there was a robot writing a Torah in Berlin, right? And, and uh -huh. I got really quite irate about this because it was not <laughs> writing a Torah, it was writing a chumash, which is uh -huh. like the five books of Moses you know, in a printed form, because a robot can't have spiritual intention. Only a human okay. can have the holiness to make the, imbue that Torah. So with this, the is, this, is, this is a key concept here. So it's not just an act of artisanship. Writing the scroll is a holy act. Yes. It's a, a which, sanctified which act. Which is why a software needs to be ethical. They need mm -hmm. to be in the right kind of frame of mind. There, there are some times where I can't do the work because if something has terribly upset me, um, wow. then I can't do the work because I don't wow. have the right frame of mind. You can't concentrate either, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Um, and if you've had a particularly bad day, mm -hmm. uh, you, you just don't feel that you've got the right intention. Right. On the other hand, yeah. if you have the right intention, there was a big power cut here the yeah. other day. My son phoned me up. He said, oh. Ali, he phoned me up. He said, that, Dad, there was a power cut. Did, did you not notice? I said, no, I was fixing Torah. Okay. Apparently, it was four, 20, 40 minutes. I don't know how long it was. I had uh -huh. no clue. Because you were in the zone. I was in the zone. So, um, so it's really interesting. So I was looking at this one Torah scroll, and uh, there's, a, there's a verse where, uh, I believe it was Genesis, uh, I want to say 24, where he says, Adoni. Mm -hmm. And what the scribe had done is written that word, Aleph, Dalad, Nun, Yud, but with the intention of it being a sanctified word. Right, which is wrong. And well. so he cut out with a razor, Aleph, Dalad, Nun, Yud, mm -hmm. referring to God, and rewrote it as Aleph, Dalad, Nun, Yud, meaning my, my Lord, oh, referring to yeah, a, a human. Um, and, uh, uh, and I was thinking, like, this is incredible. It's literally the same four letters. But it's the intent that goes into it yes. that that um, that is key in that instance. And I mean, I know of one software who is so dexterous he can he can slice off the top of the parchment with God's name on it. Yep. And without disturbing, I couldn't possibly do that. You had to a surgeon, I think, and yeah. he slices it off, uh, and then he's got clean parchment underneath to write mm -hmm. on. That's very impressive. Yeah. Scare the living daylights out of me because you're not allowed to damage God's name. Right. You're not allowed to erase a single letter. You're not allowed to erase it. Wow. So so wow. If, if you've got a problem with God's name, yeah. then there are again a whole raft of rules and you have to look up the different. And Kesset Hustle Fair goes on uh, for 
numerous pages. He has yeah, these excursions. Kessa is not is <laughs> Kessa is not by far. I mean, it's not actually the Halakha Lamas. It's not actually the doing Halakha. There are okay. other books over and above that. There, there's Mishnah Sofer, which is a commentary on Kessa Sofer. Mm-hmm. There's the Mishnah Brura on Tefillin, which is kind of slightly different. Uh-huh. There's a whole raft of different Halakha yeah. texts and different opinions. Mm-hmm. So the Taz sounds like him, the, uh, the the Taz is not Australian. Hero. It's not the Australian. <laughs> uh, the Taz is the rabbi. He's very lenient. Uh-huh. So sometimes you go, uh, you get to a repair that somebody else has done in the past. Could you leave it? The Taz probably says, yeah, it's okay. Uh-huh. Other people might be stricter. Yeah. In which case, you've got to work out in your head what yeah. you feel comfortable with. Wow. The Tiber Megillah was written on this. This is uh, this is called Gvil. This is like, it's like leather. It's really difficult to work on. So it's sort of a rough, I mean, yeah. gvil in Hebrew means, means is unhewn stones are called avne gvil. Yeah, so this is un, it's, it's non-split parchment. Okay. And this is what they used to have most Sifrit Torah written on, which is one of the reasons they're very heavy. Uh, yeah. the, the Temanim, the Yemenites, they have big on gvil. There was a big movement a few years back to try and bring back gvil. Uh-huh. Uh, but it's horrendously difficult to work on. Uh-huh. Um, so most people use this stuff, which is called clough. Uh-huh. Um, it, it doesn't have quite the rules of clough, which used to be clough. There's, there's three kinds. There's wait, gvil. wait, wait. There's gvil, <laughs> there's clough, gvil. and duxustus. Duxustus. Maybe we won't, get into, won't that. get into that one. Maybe detail. we won't get into that level of detail. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> so this stuff's much easier and whiter okay. and nicer and stuff like that. And it feels now, why good. is it white? Is it bleached? No, it's not bleached. They did go really? through. They did go through a period where the quality of the um, skin was so bad yeah. that they would coat it with a chalky substance mm-hmm. called log, which is a nightmare for anybody repairing it. because uh-huh. it means I've gotten that ink, all over my hands. The ink yeah. kind of lifts off and oh, wow. bounces off. Uh, and I've fixed yeah. a number where you fix it and then you come back to it and literally the next day it's bounced off again. Oh, wow. So you need to add some more extra gum Arabic into the ink and stuff like uh-huh. that. So, so this is the clough. Um, so you don't work anymore, or most scribes don't work anymore with the gvil, with the with the rough stuff. They're no, mostly using most very it, thin. It's, it's cloth, and cloth is the best. Thing. And, and I was speaking to a scholar about the definition of parchment, and okay. I was I was rebuked to never use that word because it has a very narrow definition of parchment and vellum, vellum and, 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 yeah. and 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 she so, she said just use the Hebrew words because those Latin words have very narrow definitions. Yeah. And even libraries will write in their their um, catalogs that it's on vellum, and they have. And she says that's completely wrong. She said you should always speak about skin based materials. Okay, fair and enough. I'm like, okay, we're just going to use the Hebrew words, which is what she suggested, because that even those have some ambiguity, because in some texts they mean one thing, and some texts they mean another thing. But and they have to be anyway. prepared in a particular way. Right. I mean, there is only one parchment maker left in the UK and does all the stuff for Parliament. Really? And so I'm writing an article on that at the moment. But frankly, yeah. uh, if I stood behind them yeah. when they put it into the line to get rid of the hairs and, yeah. I, and I made the declaration of intent again, that could be kosher cloth. But I'd have to wait, wait, so does cloth have, have to be made with the pro- intent? Absolutely. Even for a Torah scroll? Even for, but particularly for a Torah scroll. Okay. Uh, well, the only I, one you can I, I get away with is Phil and mezuzah. Mezuzah, mezuzah, you can get away with Kunta Rambam, oh. get away with not having the intent. Oh, uh, and okay. also for Megillah and other uh, sort, Megillah, of, yeah, that's sort a, of okay. Nach. Wow. Um, so, so that's that. Ink. Now, yeah. This is my, this is, uh, this is the ink I use. I get it in Israel. It's called Hadar. Uh-huh. Uh, my wife, who's a Soferet, yeah. um, she oh. was the first ever Soferet uh, in modern times. Really? Uh, Aviela. A female Aviela scribe. Barkley, female scribe. Okay. So she's my wife. Uh, it's quite an interesting household. Uh, wait, wait. So we got to back up there. <laughs> so would an Orthodox synagogue accept a Torah scroll made by a female scribe? No. Would they accept a Megillah made by yes. a female? Okay. Well, some of most of them would. Most okay. of them would, uh, because okay. there's, there's, there's lots of again lots of discussions. But the big giveaway is it yeah. says Vatichta of Esther. Esther wrote. Okay. So you can't really argue with that one because if Esther wrote it, you could argue with anything. You if you know, want to. She was. She was. As you far could, as I'd last check, she was. A lady, you could say so she ordered someone to write it. You she know, she could have, and that well, that's what some of the yeah. Orthodox will argue. I see. But generally, Orthodox would accept a... Um, well, female Megillah, most... And what about conservative Jews? You have that in the UK, Masorti? Um So Masorti would probably accept, yeah, okay. um, and that's fine. Um, so we, we do... Work, I work across the spectrum for okay. everyone. Um, my wife works in a slightly narrower spectrum, okay. depending on how um, modern progressive 
that community. Okay. Uh, so Hadar is is the ink I like. She she doesn't okay. like it. She's got a different ink, which is much shinier. I don't like it. See, if you're doing repairs, Hadar is really good because Let it's not quite as shiny. Here. Um. All right. I'm just reading the label here. Okay, they want you to water it down or to, to thin it, I guess. To thin it down sometimes. And, and actually okay. for the um, Tyburn Magilla, I yeah. did thin it down a bit because mm -hmm. I was working with something that had, yeah. it's supposed to be the blackest of black, right? But the okay. Tyburn had faded to a particular thing. And I, if I'd repaired it, black, black, mm -hmm. it would have looked ridiculous. So okay. again, it's part of the conservation. So the repairing that you were doing there is re-inking it? Meaning you're, you're going, over, it was the going over the letters that are completely faded okay. and some of them have disappeared completely. Okay. Uh, now, now, going back to God's name, are you allowed to re-ink yud heh vav -Hey? Yes, but again, with the right intention. And okay. it also depends on um, how if it's damaged faded, it. If you're it's faded, to. if it's faded, if it's faded to grey, mm -hmm. um, uh, then or brown, yeah. then you probably don't, and it's still one. It's called yeah. gufechad. It's one one body. Right, yeah. the letter is complete. Yeah. Then you don't actually need to go over it. Okay. If there are cracks in it, or bits of broken away, or bits of faded, or jumped off the skin, yeah. then you do. I see. Right? If it goes, if it fades to red, then mm -hmm. the ink was probably not kosher in the first place. Okay, if it fades to red, that's because there is iron. It's iron gall ink. No, iron gall ink's fine. Oh. It's oh, just so that the recipe the... was wrong. So, so he... tell us what. Tell us what the recipe. So the recipe. What's the secret the recipe? Secret, there are, well, okay, there <laughs> guys, are many, you're gonna hear it. The many secret, secret recipe. recipes. There are many secret okay. recipes, but they all start with these. Uh -huh. um, and these are not Maltesers, as I got off to tell Malt the children. Maltesers. Maltesers are okay. British chocolates. Uh, okay. They look I think exactly we have like this. Um, okay. Uh, and and they're not Maltesers because they're actually what's called gall nuts. So uh -huh. when you say iron gall, that's yeah. exactly what it was. Iron. It was iron sulfate or mm -hmm. copper sulfate. Some people use. Uh, and this stuff, which is basically gall nuts. So tell us how gall nuts and then Hebrew, so that's afatzim. Afatzim, and they, how they, are these made? they grow on oak trees. Okay. So the scribes go around and climb oak trees, and we pull these down. And you Do you can, have those in the UK as well? Yeah, yeah, we have them okay. in the UK. Uh, okay. These are actually picked in the UK in oh, a local really? park. Yeah. Wait, uh, you went to a local park and picked I them? I went to a local park <laughs> and picked these with my son out here when he was awesome. younger. Um, and, and, and tell us how the oak tree makes those. So basically, the gall wasp stings the oak tree, uh -huh. uh, and uh, this is a swelling, and it's tannic acid. Basically, it's pure tannic acid. Plants its babies inside, uh, and then the baby uh, comes out, um, flies away. You can see so, so the whole. So you, you can't. You, you can't. Wasps so it's completely natural. With... It's completely wow. nature. It's it's yeah. natural, and that's the thing about Torah. That everything's natural, mm -hmm. um, and you try to avoid. In fact, you try to avoid. Things that are metal, if you can avoid them, you can't always because some knives you have to use knives as well, yeah. and scalpels. But and I use I look at scalpel in terms mm -hmm. of healing because you're using the hospital. Okay. But most metal implements you want to try and avoid because yeah. they're used for war. So mm -hmm. you try and stick to the nature things. Okay. So this is um, this is you can see the the gall wasp is gone. Uh, and so, so there's I a little hole, in it. I don't there's know if they hole. can see that here. There's actually a little hole where the, where the wasps went out. And this is left behind, and this then is ground up you into a powder, grind it right? Up into a okay. powder. It's, it's basically pure botanic acid. You mix it up with the uh, with yeah. the iron sulfate. And this you is add some gum bit. Yeah. Some people add alcohol. Some people add honey. I have no idea why, because it doesn't seem to have any purpose. Okay. But it's in recipes. Yeah. Um, and then you uh, and it's in the Talmud, and it's very right. Fun. So the Talmud mentions uh, uh, afatzim. Which are these gall nuts? And uh, so this has been done for a very long time. It has, although this wasn't the original ink. In fact, there were some scribes way back when who said, oh, "We mustn't use this stuff." And that's actually you have to use the black, which is basically right. soot from right. boiling oil, so olive oil. When you collect mm -hmm. the soot from the glass, so it was boiled. It was right. or, underneath, yeah. and then right, right. you turn that into slabs of of ink, or from actual lamps that would become carbonized. Yep. And yeah, that's what's called carbon ink. The yeah. in in the so hard but, sciences, and okay. then there's another. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of arguments over ink. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, the, the statement in the Talmud is one rabbi says, "I have a substance I can throw into the ink, and it and it makes it permanent." And they then discuss, "Are we allowed to do this because of the sota, the ritual of the sota?" Right. So explain want, that. So the ritual of the sota is the, uh, the supposedly adulterous wife, and she uh, she has to mix, she, she has to eat this kind of mi noxious mix of. Earth and and parchment and writing ink written on thing with the paragraphs of the sotah. And what's interesting about adulterous. that is Maimonides says that specifically they write God's name Yudhe Vavhe and wash that and off. And they wash it off. 
and they and it's the that. only time you're allowed to damage yeah. God's name. Right. And that's why yeah. the permanency of the ink was questioned, because right. you couldn't do that if you can't wash you it can't off. Wash it right. off. Uh, you can make it very soggy and, and crap right. a bit, but you, right. you can't well, wash it off. Well, and part of that is because it stains the actual it, uh, parchment. It, it, it sits quite proud, but it also sinks in yeah. to, to the parchment. And I've seen examples where uh, you talked about how they peel off a layer of parchment. I've seen examples where they peeled off a layer of parchment yeah, still, and you can still see still, ink still, underneath. Because it's soaked in. It's it, soaked in, exactly. It depends on the recipe, basically. Right, right. So um, what's your secret recipe? So, so, so gulp, gulp nuts. No one will ever know. know. So, <laughs> it is literally, it's 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 water and, and gulp nuts and iron sulfate uh-huh. and gum arabic. Um, what is gum arabic? Gum arabic is a, a sap, resiny sap thingy. It comes from and some tree. It comes from a tree, okay. and it basically gives it an adhesive quality and a bounce. Oh. Oh, okay. So it stretches, because hmm. cause remember, you're rolling. Right. And if you didn't have that in there, they just go boing. It'd crack. Wow. Yeah, it'd crack. Okay. Um, that's one of the reasons why a lot of mazuzot the, uh-huh. uh, are actually um, not kosher, because they're written very cheaply yeah. on coated parchment, and the moment uh-huh. you roll it up, the ink cracks off. Oh, wow. So you think you're putting a kosher mazuzot up, and you're not. Uh-huh. But, because okay, but you don't know because you haven't opened you it don't up. Know. Okay. So you haven't opened it up, but it's very important that you have yeah. a cushion. So, and this is a giant mezuzah. It was a giant mezuzah. Uh, Wait, goes, did somebody actually use this? this no, nah, this is this. So somebody, I mean, actually, there are people. So some well, communal organisations will have a bit mezuzah this big. Really? Um, I did one recently for the Alexander House, which is an interfaith peace house in Germany. Oh, wow. um, so I fixed the Alexander Torah. There's also a book about that one. I'll come to that later because it's okay. very about the Shoah oh, and okay. the Holocaust. But basically, this <clears> um, somebody gave me a, a sample of new, some new cloth, and I said, "What am I going to do with this tiny bit of cloth?" I wrote okay. a giant mezuzah for, for show and tell. Okay. Um, you feel but, that? Oh, wow. Yeah. And this is using sort of um, all, all the extra tagim that some rabbis say you So tell us what the tagim are. So the tagim are, are decorative um, pieces. The rabbis say they're, they're little daggers to ward off the the, the demon Satan Ez and Guts. I've never heard that, okay. Right? Uh, Satan Ez Guts, which right. they're the letters, letters that have they actually okay. have the three tagin on, okay. uh, and the, the rabbis have this. But some story. people say they have mystical meaning. And some and... people have say they have mystical okay. meaning. And some people, and and people don't really understand the tagin particularly, but okay. there are lots of rules. Okay, so um, the next thing you need is quill. Um, so as you call them, the, the calamus. Um, and uh, I've got I've got three here um, for you to have a look at, and then a yeah. fourth. Mm-hmm. Right now, this this is a, a swan's quill. Don't tell her. Don't, don't tell her Majesty. Right? Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, tell quill. us why. I just right? heard this a few weeks ago. Because um, swans are a protected species. So, so right? swans belong to the to Queen the of Queen. England, yeah. except for there's this one college at Cambridge that's allowed to that's eat right. swan. Yes. I forget which one it is, but it's St. John's or something like this. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're really good for photo opportunities. What, what um, do you mean? So if you're, if, you're, if you're a scribe and you're doing a photo opportunity at a seal, which is a completion ceremony, yeah. fantastic to have a, 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 swan's. a swan's quill. Okay. It looks beautiful. It's but actually beautiful. writing with it? Writing with it's too soft. Ah, right. okay. Um, this is a, a goose quill. Okay. Uh, and they're good, and some people use those, but I find yeah. them too hard. Uh-huh. And this is a turkey quill. Hard meaning the material. Hard, it's, yeah. It's, it's okay. sort of, and this is a turkey quill. It has that sort of bounce yeah. in it. And it's, okay. and it's just right, as oh, really? they said, the three bears, you know. Okay. Uh, and this one, this one you don't use at all. What is it? Right. Well, you tell me. What do you think this is? Uh, some kind of bird, an eagle? It is a bird. It is actually an eagle. Well done. Okay, because it's not a kosher animal, therefore. It's not a kosher animal, okay. and it's a bird of prey. Oh. What I said about war. Yeah. And, and to, you are what you eat, kind of thing. Okay. I only it's, guessed from the context good. it was an eagle. I had no idea, but it made sense that you would, you know, it was yeah. a trick question. So yeah. you're not allowed to use this one. Really? You just mustn't use this. So, okay. very important. So, so you got your quill. Um, yeah. no, no self-respecting scribe ever, ever writes um, with, with the barb still on. You've broken <laughs> my heart! <laughs> Everyone knows no, that you do it with no, the bar no, no, on, no, and you, you don't. You're, so you don't really focus. do this. No, you don't. You don't. You don't. And the reason being, and there is halakha around this, right? So, so imagine I'm sitting down to write. Yeah. Okay? So what is going to happen with the? It's going to go up your nose. And what's going to happen? <laughs> You'll sneeze. You'll sneeze, and what happens then? Then it gets on the on the gets scroll. On the Torah. And okay. getting snot out of the Torah is next to impossible. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not one you thought you would actually... Never thought I'd have that conversation. conversation. But no, so but it's, no, it's a real... You take the barbs yeah. off, so you, you, you pull them off and, yeah. and, and stuff like that, and then you scrape it clean, uh, and then you start to basically shape, you, you shape it into yeah. the quill that you want. And that's how it works. But that looks so much more dramatic with the feather. Yeah, that's just why you have them for photo opportunities. <laughs> so you're telling me in the Middle Ages people didn't sit, sit there... Uh, in, in a monastery or Jews yeah, writing generally, with generally the big not, feather. No. But, but, okay. but when they did their manuscript illustrations, yeah, absolutely. Ah, so they do portray him. Yeah, yeah. Okay, absolutely. so it's not my imagination. I've seen that somewhere. Yeah, okay. no, they absolutely portray him okay. because that's what you say. Some of, some people will leave a little bit on. So it's artistic so it's license. artistic, you know. Okay. Uh, but that's very important. What? So is this? Oh, what is this? Gideon? What is this? Is Gideon? This is Can exactly Gideon. <laughs> yeah, if you're a vegetarian, the, I'm uh, not a vegetarian. It's definitely not uh, for you. Um, so Gideon, so, yeah. so Gid, you can tell a story if you want about the. Gid is a sin, sinew in English. So good, yeah. It, okay, so we have the story of Gid and Asher. Let, let, I'm gonna let you tell the story. Okay, so so basically, Jacob wrestled, wrestled an angel, uh -huh. uh, which some people say was Esau's angel, um, and. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's what some Midrash, people say. Yeah, I Esau's didn't know that. Wow. Um, like Esau had his own angel. He had his own angel. He, Esau was not the bad guy that actually people tend Maybe to... Maybe bad guys and angels too, I don't yeah, know. Esau was not such a bad guy, actually, hmm. in the Torah. If you read the Torah cold without getting all the commentaries and all the Midrash and all the other stuff uh -huh. that's kind of layered on, you know, um, yeah. then Esau doesn't... He's huh. not quite so Interesting. bad. Interesting. Okay. Um, but... So the angel touches the, the thigh of, of Yaakov, Jacob, uh, and uh, as a result, he, he gains a limp. He also gains a new name, Israel, because he struggled with God. And then we're not allowed to eat this. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> so, that's the Gid and Masha, according to... Yeah, yeah, this is the Gid. Oh. Right? So, the, so it's not just any Gid, it's that specific so Gid. So it's the Gid, yeah. So you can take the Gid from the thigh or the, the back of the hill, generally. Okay. Um, and, uh, and then it is rolled and spun. Uh, so you bash it with a stone and it kind of forms this kind of oh, soft, stringy. stringy stuff. And then very clever people, much cleverer than me, will, will spin it into a, a yarn. Wait, so this all comes from Gida Masha, the, yes. the sciatic... And there, and there is a secret way of doing there. this. And there are, I think, only a couple of families in Israel now. Do, I know how it's done, but... Nobody says how it's done. We won't say. We won't say. I don't, uh, is, I don't know the secret. Yeah, so this is basically what you use. And mm -hmm. whilst it looks, it kind of looks like, like yarn. nothing. It looks like yarn, it looks like cotton. You know, yeah. It's much stronger. Really? And that's what you sew the bits together. So the yuria, the, the, yeah. the, so you have a yuria, which is a sheet. Yeah. And then amudim, which are the columns on it. Yeah. And you have three to five amudim on a yuria. And uh -huh. then you have to sew them all together. And this is what you use to sew. Wow, so I didn't know they were the Gidin Asha. I knew they were Gidin. Yeah. I, that's interesting. Well, so, so wow, that's really so, interesting. So, and this isn't that uh, unusual. Like, for example, um, I, it's my understanding that I think it's violins use, like, cat sinews or something like that. Yeah. All right, so this is from a cow, though, right? Not a cat. So, so this um, is basically um, wow. what you use. And, and quite often I'm doing repairs because yeah. they're, they've come apart and yeah. stuff like that. So, you know, you have to have a spot. Actually, this morning I was looking at a Torah scroll from China. And there, instead of Gidim, they use silk. 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 Well, I knew you were going to say because I've seen that. Um, yeah. And I've actually used silk uh, myself once for an emergency repair. So fundamentally, really? silk is allowed mm -hmm. for emergency repair. If you don't have Gidim with you, they'll oh. allow silk. Yeah. And then you have to come back later and repair it properly. Uh, the Chinese one, they obviously never got around to they didn't, changing they didn't, it. Yeah, you know, yeah. they, they probably didn't have any Yidin at all in the nation, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so they use silk. Not because prepared silk in is, this manner. It was available. Silk is uh, available and mm -hmm. silk is permitted in um, Bediavet after the event if it's an emergency. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Wow. So there you go. Very cool. So, so fundamentally, um, you you need this. That's your ink. That's my keset. Uh, so keset has it. It's the yeah. inkwell of the scribe. This okay. is my inkwell, um, and and I've had it for a number of years, uh, which is uh -huh. which is good. It's Wait, so you pour the ink into pour this. the ink into that, and that's well, what you okay. dip the. It's like an inkwell. I mean, okay. I actually used to use contact lens cases because. Oh really? Cool. Yeah. When I do a seal, man. You I, make I it sound like the young things. generation should remember what inkwells are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My, look, well, my. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say when my mother was in in like elementary school that they still had inkwells. I think uh, in my generation they didn't. 
And certainly the younger generation uh, doesn't know anything past the iPhone, so. Now, before you write anything, yeah. so you've got your quill, you've got your yeah. parchment, you've got all your bits, yeah? yeah? You've got all your bits. You're ready to write, yes? Yeah. No. <laughs> no, okay. because, because apart from obviously making that declaration of intent, yeah. you also have to do this. Right, this is my okay. Amalek envelope. Your like oh, well, uh, so Amalek, the bad guys in the Torah. Um, the Amalekites, yeah. The Amalekites, who, yeah. who we are commanded, Timcheh Zecher Amalek, blot out the remembrance of Amalek. Right. From under the heavens because they are really evil. Um, now, you can't do that because A, we don't know who the Amalekites are today. Uh, so, and, and B, the police would probably be upset if you started going around blotting out Amalekites. Um, there are Amalekites knocking around. There's a lot of anti Zemites who are sadly. Well, so, so there's, an interesting, today. There's, there's an interesting paradox in the Torah because it says to write this in a scroll uh, and it includes the name Amalek and yep. then it says to blot it out. Remember to, to blot, blot it out. Remember to blot it out. Yeah. So, so you can't do that commandment, but a scribe can. Okay. So the scribe does that commandment because fundamentally yep. what a scribe does before they start to work, they will take a piece of parchment. Yeah. Write the word Amalek, wow, and then cross it out. Usually with three lines through. Okay. So it's my little Amalek, really? and and then eventually these will all get burnt. Um, but this is my little envelope for for, for show and tell. Uh, okay. And so every time you write, so every time write a every time session? you are going to start a new writing session, wow, you write Amalek and you cross it out because you're doing that commandment. Mm -hmm. So so that commandment gets done for everybody. Wow. Um, but more importantly, you are testing your quill. And uh -huh. you're testing your quill on something that you don't care about. Because okay. you don't like this word. Right, right. right this is right. not a nice word. We don't so if like you mess up on Mama Lake, that's okay? Yeah, that's if you mess up on God's name, you've got a problem. Yeah. So if your quill's rubbish, okay. you will very quickly discover that your quill is huh. rubbish. You're not allowed, in, if you're writing a Torah, and here yeah. we're writing with a little scrap of parchment, okay? yeah. but um, if you're writing a Torah or Megillah or, or Mezuzah um, or Tefillin, yeah. any of those things, although actually there are some leniencies with uh, Tefillin, uh, let's not go there, okay. um, you have to have ruled lines, okay. just like an exercise book. But actually the yeah. Hebrew hangs from the line as opposed to sits on the line. Right. Right, right? So, so you need a thing called a sargel, and this is my sargel, which is basically a, a rose thorn that's... Uh, Attached to it. That's a rose thorn. It's a rose thorn. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, weird, weird people. Right. Um, so and so you're essentially cutting a line. I'm essentially in the scoring a line. Into scoring. The okay. Right. So there's a, yeah. there's a very faint line there. And we see this it. in Torah scrolls and, and manuscripts. You see that in Torah scrolls, and, and you're supposed to do that. It's really important. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And then we're dipping the quill uh, yeah. in here. And, and I'm just going to check. That it's a reasonable cut because I cut it earlier. Um, okay, so you did that on a regular piece of paper. So I did it on a regular piece of paper. Now, okay. it's much harder to write on a piece of paper, actually. Is it really? Is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Why is that? It doesn't have the. What's the word? It's too smooth. It's too smooth. It doesn't right. have the, the, the sort of feel to it that you get with parchment. Parchment okay. just has this grit. Has a texture. It. It's a texture. It's like. Yeah. If you actually look at it partially through a microscope, it looks like a carpet. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite interesting. Interesting. So let's write Amalek. So you're writing the iron. So I'm writing the iron down here. Wow. And then you've got a couple of tug in and there because Amalek has because little doohickeys. Iron has little doohickeys. <laughs> um, so again, I want to emphasize what you said that in English, the letters sit on the ruled line. And in Hebrew, they hang from the ruled they line. From, they hang from the ruled line. So there's an uh, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. So Wait, so your mem is like a kaf and a vav. Yes, it's a kaf and oh, a vav. Nice. That's exactly what it is. And that's the actual root of the letter is a kaf and a vav. And then a lamed uh, is here. And I'm trying. I'm trying to do this big and. And your lamed has you. two little horns. Two here. little horns. And that's and on a, purpose. And that's right? on purpose. Okay. The, the decorative thing that, that goes on. And then a kuf. And a kuf is kind of like a a, a zayin. Um, hanging then, from a thing, and then also part of has a, a tug here. Yeah. Um, okay. So very pretty, very pretty, yeah, very yeah. pretty. And then we just do this <laughs> cross out, okay? <laughs> because we are blotting out, blotting out on my leg. Okay, Amalek. We that's don't interesting. Like Amalek. Well, it's interesting you do it with a strike through. Uh, I call this a strike through from Word, MS Word. Um, <laughs> So, um, that's a bit bread to get. Yeah. Well, no, so so it's interesting. So, the term for that is is people will 
will actually call this in Hebrew Havarat Kulmus, mm-hmm. but that can mean other things as well. Whereas the strike through is very specific. So, so do you ever let it dry and then scratch it off with a razor? No, you don't do that. Okay. No. When you're correcting a mistake, when I'm correcting in a mistake, the, then okay. then they're sc- scraping with the with the scalpel. Yeah. Um. Say so like it's like a hospital thing, and then right. and then you're basically polishing. You're polishing down with a smooth stone. Oh, you have some scraps. Can you show us that process on your Amalek scraps of the scratching? I, oh, I, scratching? I and I'll, and I'll, right, we'll, okay. we'll show it up here on the screen uh, for those who are watching. Um, uh, so I, I saw this uh, uh, medieval manuscript where it shows a scribe sitting in his chair and he writes with one hand Amalek and the other hand he has a razor and he's scratching it off. And it was interesting to me because it shows what tool they used, like in the you know fourteenth century so, or whatever. So, so he's wearing a little knife kit, okay, with, with a little brush to, okay, to do okay. things, a razor blade to help the the split. So this is thing. what you would do so if sandpaper. Oh, wow. So this is what you would do if there was a mistake that so didn't involve God, did not involve God's, God's name. name then yeah. you you would you would literally. And this happens all the time. It was do mistakes, this right? Very, 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 very carefully. Do... How often does it happen that there are mistakes? Like, could you write a whole Esther scroll without a single mistake? Um, I would say the last one I did, I probably had about four mistakes in it, which was pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, I did check. I was a Magia checker for for one of my yeah. colleagues, and he probably made about seven mistakes in each each sheet of Torah he did okay. on average. Um, and you just have to. Yeah. Well, it's all about concentration. Okay, it really is. But it's unlikely to write a whole scroll, even the size of Esther, which is really, really small, and not have some mistakes. So it has to be proofread. Yes. So and and the talk about in the in the Mishnah it talks about the temple courtyard proofreaders. Oh no, scratch the whole thing off, or at least the whole letter. I want to see what the process is and, and show people what it is because this is important. This is this is look th- to me one of the things that's really important about our Bible text we have today is it was copied with incredible accuracy, but it was also proofread. And like, for example, Aaron Benasher, uh, Maimonides says he proofread it for many years. Mm-hmm. Wow, so the kuf is completely the gone now. The kuf is now completely gone. And what you would do is, yeah. so so I would get a, a pencil or razor, which I didn't happen to bring today, yeah. um, smooth, smooth that out. Can you show us with the stone how you do it? Yeah, and then, and then well, so you take the stone, Yeah. And you just oh, rub it wow. around like that, and it smooths out the parchment. Oh, wow. Then I didn't bring this today because it okay. stinks. Uh, it's <laughs> called pear cloth. It's a kind of um, again a very noxious mixture. And you, mm-hmm. if you paint it onto there, yeah, it stops the ink from spreading. Mm. So when you write of, the new ink, when you mean. write the new ink, okay, that's interesting. So pear cloth is is kind of very important. I have absolutely no idea how that stuff's made. I'm okay. sure it's not very good for you if you breathe it in. Probably not. Uh, like, but it's yeah. very cool. And so this is one of the interesting things to me is when I look at these medieval manuscripts, I can see where a word was erased because it leaves a trace. So tell us about this this uh, Torah scroll from the Holocaust. You so, wrote a book about it, about how you restored it. So this, so this is, and the Amalek thing fits very nicely into yeah. this because actually uh, the biggest Amalek in, in modern times were the Nazis. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, one of the things that they tried to do was destroy Sifri Torah. Um, so they, they burnt stuff. And on Kristallnacht in particular, um, there was one synagogue that was um, the great synagogue, which was, was raided and it had all its um, Sifri Torah burnt. Wow. The Torah that was supposed to be in that synagogue yeah. wasn't, right? Because that Torah, which was written in 1790, and because it had been passed, it's a family Torah, it's the mm-hmm. Alexander Torah. It's quite famous in this country, actually. Um, Why is it called the Alexander Torah? Because that's the name of the family you own okay. it. Uh, so the Torah in the wardrobe mm-hmm. uh, basically is the history of restoration of the, the Alexander Torah. Okay. Um, and the Alexander Torah was written in 1790 um, in Germany. Mm-hmm. And you can follow it because it was passed down mm-hmm. to the the oldest male heir. Hmm. And so you can follow it all around Germany. Okay. And then you can follow it to the UK. Wow. And then it eventually f- reached my drawing board. And in fact, my wardrobe, uh, because it's so uh-huh. big, I couldn't actually keep it where I normally keep it. I had to keep it in the wardrobe. Um, it was massive, wow. massive Torah. The, the, those old ones are generally very, very um, heavy and very large because they were written by candlelight. 
so they made them large. So this is wow, that's interesting. So I was recently at the at the State Library in Berlin, and they have there the um, well, they have two things. One is they have Erfurt Six, which is a forty kilogram, that's ninety pound Torah scroll, and the librarian there, and they also have the Erfurt Bible, which is also massive. So she says to me, well, "Did they have? Were there Jewish giants in Germany?" In the, no, in the it was, literally, it was it was that. So it was functional. It was it was, it was functional okay. because because you had to. And I actually had to. So it was written in in, in Thalmassi in Germany, and I actually had to build. I'm trying to find a picture here. I had to build an extension to my drawing board in order oh, wow. to accommodate because it. Because it was so big. Because it was so huge, I actually wow. li literally had to do some special stuff in order to make sure that this was was patched properly. Wow. And so you can see here me working on it and I yeah. had to stand up for the first half of the column. I had a massive wow. back, up, back oh, you, well. it's, it's I can imagine. I'm doing it at the moment. The one from Thanet, the check scroll from Thanet, the one from Newcastle I had previously yeah. was also a check yeah. scroll. Uh -huh. Backache because wow. the first half of the column you have to do standing up. Wow. Um, on the extension, and then you can sit down. It's the machaya, which is uh -huh. a Yiddish for for a blessing, a kind of uh -huh. a wonderful thing, a relief, can, a relief where you can sit down halfway and actually carry yeah. on working on it. So, so, so this is a Torah scroll from the Holocaust that isn't part of the it's not part memorial of scrolls, not part of the memorial scrolls trust. No. So there are Torah scrolls from the Holocaust that didn't come from that here. Didn't come from here okay. at all. So this one yeah. in particular, um, it was it was supposed to have been. Donated for use in the synagogue that was burnt mm -hmm. by the Nazis on Christmas night. But yes. they turned around and said, Oh, we've got enough Torahs, we don't need another Torah. And because it wasn't there, and it was actually in a wardrobe, right? Yeah. Because the, and, and you sort of like grew the family, um, it was rescued. And then oh, when the wow. family had to flee Germany, they sent back for their belongings. And because the maid didn't know, <laughs> didn't know what it was, she put it in with the belongings. So it made its way to the UK. Wow. So, uh, it also had... It, wait, wait, wait. It, it so was nearly burnt in one so synagogue. this is before the war started she this sent it? just before the war started. So literally... Oh, wow. So if she had known it was a Torah school, she might not have... She might not have done it. And certainly the Nazis, if they had known about it, would have yeah. let it out of the country. Um, and wow. So, so, the, so, the, so the book chronicles the history wow. of where this Torah went, who, who, owned it, who potentially used it, which synagogues it was used in, Wow. Um, how it got to the UK, and then the, the massive repairs... It's also got loads and loads of the Otiot Mishunot in it. It's, it's okay. a beautifully written one. But what was really interesting, one of the things I discovered was that actually it was written by two scribes. Really? In between bits of the the master scribe, there was a student. Wow. And he's desperately trying to ape the style of the master scribe, but he's nowhere near as good. But you can tell right? the difference when you tell you the difference. Oh, wow. Most people wouldn't, but obviously yeah. I'm a software, I can. Um, and... I have a sneaking so my my theory yeah. that my theory is that the guy who wrote it um gave bits of it to the guy who commissioned it, Moshe, mm -hmm. uh Moshe Alexander, and he wrote some of it. I'm convinced of it that he was trying to write some of this Torah. Because okay. uh, I've come across this before, in fact, recently. Meaning the patron wrote some of it. The patron wrote okay. some of it, because that means they own the Torah. He's part of the, the Torah. Because the commandment yeah, is part to of write the Torah. your Torah, write, write for yourself I heard that Torah. sometimes the, some, the, the patron will write like the last the few last words. The last few words, or the okay. last letter sometimes. Okay. Um, or, or, you know, or Torah Tzivala Nung Moshe Moshe Kilat Yaakov, they will write that verse. That was my father's favorite verse in, in the Bible. Torah uh, Lenu Moshe Moses commanded us the Torah and inheritance for the congregation of yes. Jacob. So basically, it's actually on his on his uh, tombstone. Really important verse, and sometimes uh, yeah. the patron will will write, that, write that verse. Okay, might start with Bereshit, write the first words yeah. there up to God's name because you don't want to, you don't want somebody who's not a scholar writing God's name because they okay. mess it up. Um, and then that Torah Tivalanu, and then maybe the hmm. the end bit. Wow. But this one, it was all over the place. There was uh, three lines here and five yeah. lines here. And so, so it was an apprentice? Convinced or, of it. Okay. Either an apprentice or it was the patron. The reason okay. I think it's the patron is yeah. because the master would not have let some of that work go through. It was so bad. Uh, <laughs> I actually had to repair it. Okay, whereas right. if it's the patron, it's like, you did this, what do you want <laughs> yeah, from me? Yeah, exactly. So, okay. <laughs> so I, I think he went easy Makes sense. on the patron, oh, whereas wow. he probably wouldn't have gone easy on the apprentice. My, my, do you uh, let the patron write, or whoever it was, write God's name? I don't think I remember seeing God's name. Really Ooh, right so I'm, I'm pretty convinced. So it's really quite interesting. So it's, it's a fascinating story.
Can you tell us any last things about being a scribe? Any uh, any things you want to share share with the audience? So I think being a scribe it's very different. Obviously, I mean, you know, in my my normal day, I'm, I'm surrounded by technology, and then mm. I'm not. I'm suddenly in the world of parchment and quills and ink and yeah. stuff like that. Um, but the really the best thing for me about being a, a software is that you have a personal relationship, a deep in intimate relationship with text, mm. with no intermediaries. Wow! Because wow! Because most people will read the Torah with Rashi, yeah. with the commentator, or Rambam, or yeah. Ramban, or yeah. every commentator known unto man, yeah. uh, or they'll be looking at stuff from the point of view of Midrash and uh -huh. stories that are actually not in the Torah at all, mm -hmm. and you know things are, and almost have taken on um, like they're in the Torah, but they're not. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's very important. Um, but if you read the text, and I know yeah. because I've seen some of your stuff, yeah. you read the text. I do love the text. And you go, and you look at it, and you go, ah, oh, that's what it really meant back yeah. then in the time it was actually written. Yeah. And subsequent interpretation may have taken it in a completely different direction, mm. but actually what they meant was mm. this. And yeah. by reading that cold, so, yeah. you know, disintermediate, raw, in sense, right? raw yeah. you, you, you get way more out of it. Because you, because you have that personal relationship with the text. Wow, that's amazing. Well, thank you so much. And uh, guys, go to his website, sofer.co.uk, and learn more about uh, what he does and his 16 or 17 books, and maybe commission him to write a Scroll of Esther or something. Thank you, uh, Mordechai. Awesome. Shalom. Shalom. You have been listening to Hebrew Voices with Nehemia Gordon. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's Makor Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at NehemiasWall.com.